So welcome everybody. My name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the um, co-founder and uh, national convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. I'm very pleased to welcome you today to what I think is going to be a very interesting discussion with some excellent speakers about um, what it might look like to create ecocide laws within the Australian context. So um, first I'd like to do um, a proper welcome. So um, just bear with me and I will share screen. So um, before I talk and introduce, talk about and introduce our speakers, I'd like to acknowledge country. Um, my name is Michelle, as I said, and I live, work and play here in the beautiful lands of the Yagara Turrbal peoples um, in North Brisbane. Um, I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and the remarkable um, culture and civilizational governance system that the first peoples of this continent used since time immemorial and continue to use to care for country and to care for each other. Today's discussion is going to be really interesting and I've been looking forward to it a great deal myself. Um, in a moment, I'll um, introduce you to our speakers, but the main topic that we're exploring is um, the rise and rise of uh, popular understandings of ecocide law at the international level um, has meant that many people have been considering what that looks like at the national level um, at the domestic law level here in Australia. So our topic today is looking at ecocide laws in the Australian context. The order of speakers um, is hopefully will unravel a story about what's going on in the world of ecocide. Um, and just to read down through um, what we think we're covering. Um, so I'll give a very brief introduction to the broader picture of earth-centered law and governance and how we see ecocide as really fitting into this emerging family of laws. And then Dr. Gwyn McCarrick will talk about how, how we might, how might ecocide laws be created in Australia. Uh, Gwyn has a dearth of expertise in this space, which she can share with you in her own talk, um, but she's now currently completing a book uh, on ecocide. So um, we're very lucky to have her talking about this. And I'm hoping that Gwyn will also give some very practical um, insights for you all about if we were to do an ecocide law in Australia, where would that go? Is it Commonwealth? Is it state? What does it look like? Uh, as well as some of the bigger issues in the international scene. Then Professor Rob White will talk um, about a whole range of issues that are both, I guess, a cause for concern when we're trying to think about the law of ecocide. Um, so I've just titled it principles and elements to include in an ecocide law and to consider more generally. And then we're very delighted to also have Professor Danielle Salamaya and Professor Anthony Burke talking about um, really some of the deeper challenges of what ecocide or omnicide is all about and what do we have to consider as human earthlings when we're really trying to protect um, the broader living world and what do the current um, developments in the international definition of ecocide and beyond, what do any of them mean really for the practical implementation of caring for non-human animals um, across the planet. So it's a very rich discussion. The goal will be that um, we'll each have about 10 minutes to run through some core issues and then we'll open up for discussions at the end. So as I said, please do pop your written questions into the chat and we'll try to get through to them as we can. So I'll take my um, facilitator hat off now and, and give my eight minute overview, uh, or hopefully a bit less to give others more time. I'd personally like to thank all of the speakers for joining us in this AILA hosted event. And I'd like to introduce you, if you're not familiar with the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, to our not-for-profit organization, AILA. AILA was created in 2012 um, by a group of uh, very concerned and earth-centered uh, lawyers. And what we're very interested in is advocating for systems change to create earth-centered governance in industrialized societies. And of course, our focus and passion is for Australia. Um, I'll talk in a moment about the theory of earth jurisprudence, which is a term coined by deep ecologist and geologian, Thomas Berry, but it's his initial spark around earth jurisprudence that got myself and others thinking, what would it look like for Australian law and Australian governance systems to be, to be transformed into something that actually deeply cared for life? So the work we do is very much looking at what structural change um, in these underpinning institutions, laws, culture would look like in Australia 
if we were genuinely Earth-centered. So our focus is on law, economics, education, ethics, culture and the arts, and um, some might call it cross-cultural work, but it's a deep, deeply informed by Indigenous knowledge systems, which I'll talk about. So this little tree um, is just a way of saying that, that the, the roots of Ayla's interests is about love of the living world, um, human beings included, um, the joy that comes from um, the biodiverse landscapes, um, company from our evolutionary companions, um, and I guess the moral obligation to care for and do a better job than what we've been doing in industrialized societies and being custodians or stewards or simply admirers of the living world. So Ayla's inspiration is twofold, earth jurisprudence and Western deep ecology, particularly in the early days, the initial work um, that Thomas Berry did around earth jurisprudence and rights of nature, but also deeply informed by both the work, the writings and our relationships with uh, remarkable indigenous elders such as Mary Graham and Anne Polina. So Ayla's work um, is very much focused on how we challenge colonial structures in Australia, um, how we learn from indigenous elders and cultures, but how we take responsibility. Um, there's something like 95, 96% of the Australian population is not indigenous. How do we create bridges into um, earth-centered culture in our own cultural and legal systems? So Earth Jurisprudence talks about um, a whole range of structural ways to rethink the governance systems that have been created in modern societies. Um, and really this image shows the core element of what it's trying to change from and what it's trying to change to. So Earth Jurisprudence um, asks us to examine the root causes of the current ecological crisis and shift from this notion on the left of humans at the top of things and all other animals either being classified by um, flawed modes such as their sentience or ability to feel pain. Um, and a lot of those ideas which have emanated out through um, certain monotheistic religions and other worldviews. And how do we shift towards something that indigenous cultures have never lost um, and something that is perhaps more reflective of our modern scientific understandings of life on earth, which is the image on the right. The idea that we are um, just a group of molecules uh, lucky enough to have sentience and opposable thumbs, and we really have no more right to be here than a mushroom or a snail, and we certainly have no right uh, to take away the lives of animals, particularly making them extinct. So this is the world's most clunky diagram, and I'm proud of it. Um, it's my little umbrella. Just to remind folks who perhaps are not entirely familiar with the work Ayla does, or Earth Jurisprudence, um, what we have been seeing, particularly in the 21st century, is building on the back of um, more traditional notions of human-centered environmental law, we've seen this rise and rise of Earth-centered law inside Western systems. And by Western systems, I also mean some of the legal systems that colonial powers have brought into um, previously indigenous controlled territories and places. So, on the left, you see Earth Jurisprudence, which I'll mention a bit more about in a minute before I hand over to Gwyn, um, and some aspects of Earth-centered laws that are rising um, in both discourse and discussions and in real application, like rights of nature, legal personhood structures for nature, uh, this broader framing that um, wonderful writers and thinkers, particularly from um, uh, the ELGA, Ecological Law and Governance Association, like uh, Jeff Garver, Klaus Bosselman and others looking at ecological law, um, which incorporates many aspects of earth-centered law. And to me, that left-hand side of the umbrella includes ecocide, this rise of concern about not only what we're doing to the planet, um, but how we rein that in. All of these issues, and there's so many more under that side of the umbrella, are trying to push back at the destructive nature um, of industrialization across the planet. On the other side, we've got the older, deeper, legal systems of indigenous peoples. And I'm using a few framing words there that are used by Mary Graham and Anne Polina and others. Um, so first laws, the idea that the land is the source of the law. This is a term that Anne Polina uses a lot. Um, she's a remarkable scholar, thinker and indigenous leader from um, the Kimberley, the Matawara River uh, area. And then Mary Graham gives these amazing insights into the deep relationist ethos, the law of obligation, um, and the uh, what she calls the sacralized ecological stewardship 
uh, culture of Indigenous peoples across this continent. And at the moment, we're seeing articles being written by Anne Polina in partnership with other non-Indigenous writers like Erin O'Donnell and Alex Palazon about if we must have something like a rights-based approach, what about the rights of ancestral beings? What does that look like? So all of these issues, I just wanted to give you a big picture context to ecocide um, for many folks, particularly overseas, when they're advocating for ecocide, they have a singular focus. Uh, certainly for AILA, we value that and we see the importance of that in advocacy, but we also analyze it and think about it in the bigger picture of how we shift our entire culture, legal system, economic system, to care for life and to really protect the living world. So um, to that end, AILA has um, only in the early parts of this year um, started hosting uh, the Aussie branch of the international group, Stop Ecocide International. Um, and with together with uh, Gwyn McCarrick, uh, who's co-hosting with me, the Ecocide Laws Australia Working Group, um, which is really starting to look more deeply at what this looks like in Australia. Um, I'm not going to speak too much of this. For anyone who's not familiar with Earth jurisprudence, I guess I just wanted to give a plug for a really key book that helped me use a kind of cohesive framework to bring a whole bunch of concepts together. Thomas Berry looks at these underpinning fundamental establishments that control human affairs, that he calls them, um, analysed their anthropocentrism um, and really certainly uh, sparked interest in those of us who created AILA into how do we unpick the anthropocentric nature, the destructive elements of our economy, our legal system, et cetera, and how do we rearrange things and transform them? So that's uh, an important book for us. But the, the mere fact that our industrialised societies have failed profoundly to recognise that it's in relationship with the living world um, and to use it up to the extent that we are now not just terraformers, uh, but climate changers. Um, these are obviously the, the dastardly issues of our day. Um, so I just wanted to end my little introduction by sharing a photo of Mary Graham, um, both a remarkable human being, a very dear friend and an amazing mentor. Um, she and I are working on a book where we're exploring what Australian society could look like if it was built on the relationist ethos and this idea of ecolo ecological uh, custodianship or stewardship. And our sister organization, Future Dreaming Australia, um, which has been running a lot of workshops since COVID hit and has got a whole range of projects for next year. Um, I sort of recommend Future Dreaming to you as well. It's uh, a really terrific place to explore the First Nations people's um, views, ideas and understandings in this continent. So that is my sort of brief contextualization of both the big picture of earth laws and earth centered everything very briefly and quite unsatisfyingly, but I hope you can see a little bit of the range that Ayla is fascinated with and, and involved in. Um, and now it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Gwyn McCarrick, um, who's a, a lecturer at the University of Tasmania. Um, and Gwyn is going to talk to us a little bit about what might it look like to have ecocide laws in Australia. So thank you, Gwyn. Um, will, will I be able to share um, screen? Can we do that? Um, yes, you can now share screen. Thank you. Lovely. Um, great. So um, thank you and thank you, Michelle, for um, uh, having me. Um, what I propose today to, is to talk a little bit about the, um, the work of the AILA um, working group, um, looking at implementing uh, ecocide law in Australia, uh, but I just wanted to make a few preliminary uh, comments as well. So I wanted to talk about the idea that both environmental law and criminal law are very much grounded in domestic law. That's a really important uh, thing uh, that we need to remember. The second um, as it, is that in order to meet the, um, our current ecological and climate emergency, uh, we need to not only um, promote international cooperation, but we also... Excuse me, Gwyn, I really hate interrupting when you're talking. Um, can you no. just check your mic microphone? Um, it's, at first it was a bit too close and now it's a bit too far away. Too far away. How's that? Is that That's sounding better. right? Yes, thank you. 
So the, the second is is that in order to meet our um, the climate emergency and um, ecological crisis, we need to promote international cooperation, but also um, to to what we call in in international law is vertically integrate our laws, um, and that's I suppose a fair work of what. Uh, the AILA Working Group is doing is looking to implement ecocide laws in our own uh, domestic laws, or what we call vertical integration. Um, and I'll talk a little bit um, about um, what that might look like as well. But firstly, the, the um, first comment that I wanted to make is that um, in international environmental law, there are two opposing concepts that are, are at play and that are shaping um, international environmental law. The first concept is that a state has exclusive or sovereign right over its natural resources to exploit without limit um, uh, to extinction if, if it so chooses, except for um, those territories that are identified as um, national heritage or native title. Um, the second principle is that um, and this is the opposing principle, is that a state must not commit a trans-boundary uh, harm on the territory of another state. And this is where the international community is really starting to inhabit that space. Because um, we remember that the international community is founded on the idea that it regulates the relationships between states. Um, and so where we're talking about trans-boundary harm, or a state committing a harm on another state, then we can start to see that uh, the international community um, can have uh, a role. Um, we know that our um, ecological boundaries, our ecosystems are complex and interdependent, and we know that our ecological systems don't follow any particular state boundaries. We also know that our global commons extend beyond the national uh, uh, borders, that are that extend beyond borders, um, are shared resources uh, that need to be communally uh, protected. And so there's this duty to uh, this duty to commit a transboundary harm has given the international community a real ro role in, in regulating that, that harm. So um, there's been an, a, a um, significant uh, debate on the, in, on the international scene around making ecocide an international crime, which, for, which essentially means that we would um, embed the, the crime of ecocide along with the other uh, four atrocity crimes into the Rome Statute. Um, this would have normative value in, in communicating to the world this is abhorrent behaviour, but it also has the um, capacity um, to have this crime attract what we call universal jurisdiction. Um, it, it means that it can be tried on an international basis um, and that um, uh, it would also attract the ability to be able to be prosecuted and um, attract penal um, sanction. Um, so up and until this happens, until um, ecocide is what we call codified in the Rome Statute, um, international crimes of this nature fall into a category of what we call transnational crimes. And I do say to all of um, uh, transnational students, you must remember that crimes are national. There is no international agreement on what an, a transnational crime is, and there's no inter, inter, international uh, consensus on what um, uh, crimes ought, to, how crimes ought to be defined, what categories of crimes. Um, so every every state, every jurisdiction is is different on this score. So um, so transnational crimes then are criminal law that has a transnational um, dimension. Uh, so we can often call these treaty crimes because they're crimes that have made their way into an international treaty. Um, but really we're looking at those crimes that um, we need international um, cooperation. We need states to cooperate on an extraterritorial basis. Uh, but we also need those states to vertically integrate those treaty crimes into uh, their own domestic legislation. And remember that that's competing with what I said in the beginning, that um, uh, states 
um, and in, um, have an exclusive um, power over, over um, their environmental resource, resources. So we can go one of two ways. We can either codify um, ecocide, put it into the Rome statute, um, uh, have it so in such a way that it, it's sitting there um, as um, a crime that attracts universal jurisdiction, that it could be tried um, by any state uh, on the basis of uh, complementarity, or we have it as a transnational crime where it really is sitting there with limited transnational value, um, part of those loosely aligned values of states, um, where really state sovereignty and self-interest are really um, dominating. Um, so, and that's really the, um, the way it exists at the moment in a legally pluralistic uh, world where there really is no um, true consensus on, on either the content of the crimes or, or no real uh, willingness to, um, to cooperate on that basis. So when we drill down then and we look at how that would actually look in Australia, um, we then have to look at Australia's criminal um, codes and, and, and how that's set up. So criminal law in Australia is the responsibility um, is shared between the states and territories and the federal government. So, and that's really a product of our Australian constitution, which really only gives limited rights to the federal government uh, on issues of crime. So we've got a criminal legal system that differs across the states. Um, we can see real differences in, um, in the different jurisdictions in terms of the offences, the definitions, the sentencing, and criminal procedure. So, um, and then importantly, we have um, in Australia, we have states that are what we call the code states and states that are um, common law states. So the code states are Western Australia, Queensland and Tasmania. Um, and they have wholly replaced judge-made um, criminal law inherited from England. Uh, and they've put in its place a legal instrument known as a criminal code, um, which exhaustively defines the criminal codes. Uh, other states then have retained criminal law um, inherited in, uh, from the common law, albeit sort of mod modulated through um, successive pieces of legislation. Uh, so that's our setup. In fact, um, we find that, that um, crime in Australia is not only um, nationally defined, but it's more complex than that. It's actually decry uh, defined by the individual uh, states. So um, if we think about then inclusion of an ecocide law in Australia, and I want to really sort of um, limit my comments here to what if we included the international experts um, definition into the criminal code, make it no, no more complex than, than that. Um, then we have to look at the, the um, specific uh, code states. I'll concentrate on those first because that, that allow, allows us to, to um, work with a definitive um, instrument, an authoritative instrument of what crime actually is. So Western Australia, Queensland and Tasmania have our codes and those codes are a product of, of history. That is, they're not static. All of the codes in Australia are anthropocentric in that they view crime historically as human harm. Um, that is, it defines in categories of crimes against the person, uh, crimes against property, et cetera. Um, and then each of the codes then break into uh, parts and then into categories of, of crime like assaults, homicides, uh, sexual offences, drug offences, et cetera. So if we were to insert the crime of ecocide into any one of our Australian codes, um, then we'd be looking at inserting a new crime, um, not only a new uh, category of crime, but a new family of crime. That is to say, um, the crime that would be inserted might be called something like a crime injurious to the environment which by inserting it into a criminal code would really place emphasis on the environment as a victim. Um, and that's really uh, very important for the work of AILA where it comes from that um, uh, uh, rights of, of nature perspective. Um, as well as that, it's also a novel um, 
in, uh, construction in that uh, it's, it would be um, implemented into uh, the criminal code as a new category of crime, a crime that hasn't been um, conceived of previously um, and a crime specifically uh, against the environment. Uh, if we were to use the international expert definition of ecocide, that crime then would have uh, two particular thresholds. First, there would need to show that uh, the crime, um, sorry, that there exists a substantial likelihood that the conduct, um, the act or omission uh, on behalf of the defendant will cause severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment. And secondly, the, the second threshold is that that act or omission was uh, either unlawful uh, or unwanted. Um, the word wa uh, wanton, according to the expert panel, um, uh, introduces a proportionality test. That is that the, um, the test uh, would be a requirement for the court to weigh the prohibited environmental harms against the social or economic uh, benefits. Um, uh, and here the, the court itself is not weighing up factors of equivalence. It's really that test of proportionality is whether or not uh, the relevant harm uh, caused is excessive. Um, and I would, I would suggest in, in my interpretation of, of uh, that definition, if the crime itself meets the threshold of uh, severe harm, then I think any, any consideration of social or economic benefit would uh, be invalidated. Again, the word wanton as a, as a qualifier in the definition uh, would mean that um, uh, there are certain crimes that all, might be lawful, but are nevertheless um, uh, uh, a crime because they transgress that uh, criminal threshold of, of recklessness. And um, uh, there's been a lot of talk on the international scene around the mental element for um, ecocide. Um, now, Glenn, I, I really hate sorry. interrupting, but I just wanted to let you know you've got that one Time. minute left. Yeah. One minute, perfect. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, so in terms of uh, mental element, uh, the uh, in, in in most criminal codes, uh, they look there. There is a requirement that the crime itself be an intentional act. Um, uh, we all know that uh, uh, in uh, uh, the environmental harm context that uh, generally speaking corporations don't go out with an intent to cause harm they go out with an intent to, to uh, make a profit um, and so the model law recognizes this um, and tries to incorporate uh, the idea of recklessness requiring that there's a substantial likelihood that the um, the individual knew that they were that their acts would cause uh, severe harm. And that becomes the default um, standard. Um, fi uh, one final comment before final comments, and that is um, on the issue of exclusion. I think any um, sort of law reform in this area is going to need to allay the fears of um, uh, uh, d different legitimate industries in Australia. Uh, so there would need to be an exclusion clause that um, sets out what um, uh, types of activities are considered legitimate and legal and therefore uh, excluded from um, uh, uh, prosecution of, of, uh, of this kind. Um, uh, with reference to the appropriate land use um, or relevant uh, planning schemes uh, or reference to the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act if, uh, if the proposed activity uh, is likely to cause significant impact. Um, so the final comments then is that criminal laws in Australia are complicated. They're complicated by the fact that um, they're not determined by um, a national um, authority, they're determined by the, the individual states. Criminal codes are um, themselves not static. They're always using these twin determinants of harm and morality to really justify the addition or the removal of, of uh, crimes. Uh, so ecocide uh, law reform then will really need 
to um, generate some support from political representatives that will hopefully carry forward this, uh, these reform bills uh, through their respective uh, states. Um, and you know, states who follow this particular path uh, will have the uh, honor of being progressive states, being early adopters of, of ecocide law, um, with the, the distinct advantage of vertically integrating um, ecocide law, this important uh, law reform uh, from a bottom up, while we were also work from the top down uh, approach by uh, uh, codifying it in the Rome Statute. So we can work from a state basis and also work from uh, an international basis at the same time. Sorry, sorry, I might have gone over time, Michelle, but that's, that's it from me. I'll just uh, stop sharing. Thank you so much, Gwen. Um, that was an excellent introduction to some of the big picture issues and also down to the nitty gritty of what it would look like in the Australian context. Thank you so much. Thank you. A number of questions that have come through, we're gonna save them up for the end if that's okay, everyone. Um, and so now I'm really uh, grateful to Gwen for setting the scene for what's possible, what the constructs in Australia might be. And now um, hand over to Professor Rob White from University of Tasmania to share some of his thoughts on the legal and other issues connected to uh, ecocide law. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the, the Palawa people of Utuwita, uh, the First Nations people of Tasmania. Um, and that welcome or that acknowledgement actually gets to the heart of what some of this is on about. And that is that this is aspirational and political. So in a sense, we're not talking about really introducing ecocide as, as a law that's gonna make a difference without a political struggle. Because basically there's, it's power and interest and conflict, which is why the world's in the condition it's in today. So this is really part of a political struggle. Um, the attempt at climate litigation or law reform of therapeutic jurisprudence and wild law and so on, these are part of a political push to change how we do things and how we think about things. Uh, but let's always be clear that this is a political process. Um, it's not a straightforward technical process of, of law reform as such. Uh, what I wanted to do was briefly mention three things and I ask three questions. What is the goal? What is it that we're trying to achieve? What is the mechanism? whereby we achieve that goal. And the third thing is, what are the operational aspects of these mechanisms that we're trying to put into place? Now, I'm not gonna describe all of these in depth because a lot of it's already been covered and will be covered in the discussions. But I'll start by saying that when we think of the goal, we can, we can abstractly get some lessons by reading the, the literature, for example, on ecocentrism. Uh, and contrast what an ecocentric perspective that is looking at the intrinsic value of nature, contrast what that looks like compared to an anthropocentric or human-centered view. Uh, we could talk about non-human environmental entities such as rivers, mountains, non-human animals, plants, and so on. Uh, at the end of the day, when we talk about ecocentrism, of course, we also need indicators of what is ecocentrism in practice. So it's not just a philosophical orientation. It's also saying, okay, how do we demonstrate an ecocentric approach? Ecocentrism is part of the principles. Another part is the rights of nature. And again, I'm not gonna go into this. There's a fair bit of discussion around that with specific examples from Ecuador, Bolivia, New Zealand, India, and so on, in terms of mountains and rivers and, and certain non-human creatures that have been given uh, legal personhood. Uh, but for me, that's one of our starting points is the idea of rights of nature and also ecocentrism. But also we can look at what's already existing in law. So for example, in New South Wales, um, there, the description of ecological sustainability uh, is embedded in a whole range of different legislation and it includes things like the precautionary principle, intergenerational equity, conservation of biological diversity and ecological in integrity, uh, polluter pays principles and so on. So this is stuff that is already embedded in some laws. And I think that when we talk about what is the goal, uh, for me, the goal is a, is a combination of those three things, ecological sustainability, ecocentrism, 
and the rights of nature. Then the question is what kind of laws will get us there? And I think there is where, in my mind, uh, ecocide is only one of, of a series of laws that need to be put, put together in order to, to bring alive those principles. Um, so for example, in Victoria with the new EPA Act, they have a general environmental duty of care, uh, mainly in relation to pollution offenses. And I think that's a really good starting point because in fact, there are criminal offenses associated with that general environmental duty of care. So if you basically bugger up the environment, uh, you can be li held liable uh, under this general environmental duty of care. And basically, a general think of what that means, a general environmental duty of care. You wouldn't ask the federal environment minister this, of course, uh, because she's fighting against any notion that she has an obligation or a duty of care. But I think if you can embed that kind of thing in law, then it really opens the door, in my mind, for ecocide uh, in a really profound way. Um, when we talk about ecocide, and I know we've had discussions amongst some of ourselves over the mental element, my own view, uh, taking into account that in different jurisdictions, different kinds of environmental offenses uh, are deemed to be strict liability. That's where I would go with it. Strict liability means it doesn't matter what your intent was uh, or, or whatever. Uh, if there's harm, there's damage, then you will be held accountable. Now, strict liability is not the same as absolute liability. In other words, there's a defense to strict liability, which means that if people genuinely have a, a, a reason for why they've engaged in harmful behavior, then the court will listen carefully. Um, but strict liability does not also does not mean that we don't deal with questions of foreknowledge and intent, because it's at the sentencing stage when all that comes back in. So basically, strict liability does not mean that you get rid of the mental element. It just means it, it's, in a sense, shifted to the sentencing stage where when we are adjudicating, we think what kind of sanction or penalty we want to assign to somebody who's, who's engaged in ecocide, uh, then we need to look at these kinds of factors. The other thing I'll say about ecocide is that the way it's constructed internationally is, is basically human-centered. Um, so basically, um, it's the law pertains to harms that affect humans rather than an ecocentric approach. So ecocide is a crime against humanity, not necessarily a crime against the earth. And so those are two things that I think uh, are very important to consider. The idea of strict liability and the idea of an ecocentric conception of ecocide. The third thing, and I'll say this briefly, is that we also have to think of how do you institutionalize this stuff? So if we were gonna get to the stage where we did get some laws up, how do you institutionalize it? For me, the key, one of the keys, is to make sure that we have courts that are ecologically savvy. In other words, it's no use having a court that doesn't understand ecology. Um, so for me, the institutionalization part of ecocide and the developments towards ecocide is making sure that we have courts that develop over time expertise. We have probably, I think it's the oldest environment court in the world with the New South Wales Land and Environment Court. And if you study some of their judgments, you think, oh, this is amazing because the judges in that court who have the equivalent power of a Supreme Court judge, these judges have 40 years of the wealth of knowledge relating to ecology and harm to the environment and harm to animals and so on. And it, and it shows in their judgments. And I think that what we have to do is develop specialist in institutions. It doesn't necessarily have to be an environment court, a separate environment court, but it does require a separate division or separate specialist expertise within the judiciary. If you're gonna actually get any purchase from um, charging somebody with the crime of ecocide, we could extrapolate from that to the international level. It's no use having the international criminal court dealing with ecocide if you don't have the expertise. Um, so the International Criminal Court would either have to develop, have a division dealing with ecocide specifically, so that you have the ecological expertise amongst other things, or you'd have to create an international environment court. But I think we, we do have to seriously think, consider that question of not only getting your principles identified and getting the laws in place, potential laws, and how the law, different laws have to interconnect, but you have to think of how do you institutionalize 
the, the mechanisms in a way that means that we can con concretize the, the practices and the activities. Uh, and I'll leave, I'll leave you with this thought. Uh, in TASI, we're also doing some work around therapeutic justice on other issues relating to drug courts and so on. And what's clear from some of that reform work is that we need to not only bring in a law relating to ecocide specifically, but we have to change the Sentencing Act. Uh, the Sentencing Act, for example, uh, when we look at the, the provisions of the Sentencing Act in Tasmania, we could add a clause uh, that the court should impose sentences directed at the issues that the court is satisfied are linked to the damage caused to the environment. So we can actually insert clauses into the Sentencing Act. Likewise, uh, there are protocols for, the, for judicial appointments. Uh, and we can go through those protocols. And my suggestion would be to include a new clause under the judicial protocols that says uh, the following should be considered. A person who has an appreciation of, of the principles of ecocentrism slash ecojustice and restorative slash reparative justice and the application of those principles. So I think there's stuff across different pieces of legislation that would need to be done. But at the end of the day, bear in mind that this is definitely a political process. I think it's really important that people like criminologists, myself, that lawyers and others use the language of criminality. Because the ones who have talked about ecocide the most have not been lawyers, have not been criminologists. It's been journalists and scientists. And I think it's uh, terrific if we can all start using that kind of language to talk about the crimes against nature. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rob. Very interesting points. And um, there's a couple of questions that have been stimulated by your talk, which we'll come back to. Um, so now I'm very grateful to introduce um, our next speaker, uh, Professor, Professor, Professor uh, Denny Salamaya um, from um, the University of Sydney. And I know that she and uh, Professor Anthony Burke or Tony um, from the from UNSW have been, have been working on a paper together, which is very interesting and raises a whole bunch of um, important issues. So I might hand over to you, Danny, but if you and Tony want to present separately or together, entirely up to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and everybody for being here. I also want to begin by acknowledging that I am supported here, standing here on the lands of the Darawal people uh, to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and to thank them for the care of the kinship relationships that make it possible for us to live in this entangled world. Um, so Rob and Gwyn have given really terrific legal and somewhat uh, political perspectives. Uh, I am going to start with a bit more of an embodied perspective and move to a bit of a critical philosophical perspective. Um, so the theme of this session is ecocide in Australia. So I just want to um, bring us to a bit of the embodied ecocide uh, in Australia, or what I came to call on the side. And um, I wanted to talk a bit about how that word came to me. So on the 5th of January, for those of you who are in the southeast of Australia, you will remember with your bodies and those of you who are elsewhere in Australia will remember through images, the 4th of January 2020 was one of the two worst catastrophic fire days in the Black Summer Fires. Uh, we were driving back to our home, having evacuated the day before, uh, seriously having thought that this entire place where I am now and all the beings who live here was going to have been immolated. As we were driving back, um, I was listening to the radio, the information that was starting to come in about the number of beings who had been killed, um, the extent of the ecosystems that had been destroyed. At that stage, we didn't know the full extent of the damage. We now know that three and a quarter billion, an unimaginable number of animals were killed in those fires and 18 and a half million hectares of, of land were burnt. And as I was listening to the reports, there were two words that were used repeatedly about what was going on, natural disaster and tragedy. Um, as we know, there is nothing natural about the nature that is, uh, that is exploding through these 
massive conflagrations that are um, leaving the land like a nuclear explosion, not like a regular fire that's part of the Australian landscape, nor is this a tragedy. Tragedy is something that Shakespeare wrote as he wrote in King Lear, as flies to boys are we to the gods, right? It's something that rains down on us as if we don't have any responsibility for what's going on. And it was in that context of a really embodied confrontation with this unimaginable level of death that I thought about the word on the side, which I then uh, found out had been used earlier in relation to nuclear holocaust. Now, what struck me in that context was that we needed to reframe this mass murder that was going on. We needed to move to a language and a framework from a context where certain beings are killable but not murderable. They're killable as a matter of course, as the regularized outcome of the way that we have come to live in capitalist extractivist systems as Michelle articulated so powerfully at the beginning. We need a reframing that conveys that these deaths are neither natural nor unavoidable, um, that they are the completely predictable results of an extractive capitalist form of life, and that they flow as a matter of course from this normalized way of living. We need to express, as Rob said, and as Michelle said, the intrinsic value of other earth beings whose survival is no less important than ours, but also the entanglement, which means that we live or die together. Um, and so that word omnicide came to me as a way of thinking about it's everything. It's everything in this entangled web of life that we now understand through science, through indigenous knowledges, et cetera, that, it, that this is how earth beings come into existence and move out into existence. And also that there is responsibility here and there is accountability for, the, for all of this death. Um, now, part of what I was trying to convey there, and I'm not going to go into that here, is that the responsibility is very multi-layered, um, that, that while we can point to particular culprits, fossil fuel industries, the Murdoch press, this is a multi-layered um, background of causality which ends up in the ecocidal situations which are now prevalent all over the world. So against that very big background, um, somewhat differently, but similarly to the question that Rob asked, I want to ask what does a crime of ecocide add to our toolkit as allies of earth beings in the age of omnicide? Um, and I just want to give two broad answers to that question. Um, and, I, and, and you'll see uh, there's something of a disagreement that I have with, with Gwyn's interpretation of the, um, of the proposal but also cont continuous with her analysis. So a law that criminalizes ecocide um, could, so the question here is what can law do, right? What could a law of ecocide do? What is the work that it does in the world potentially? So the first is that it could potentially hold accountable those who are most directly responsible for ecocide, for the killing of ecosystems and nature by punishing them. And the extent that it does that, um, it has three main, it serves three main purposes of law, retribution, specific deterrence and general deterrence with general deterrence being the most important run, right? We wanna punish people or prosecute people so that other people are deterred from taking the same action. But we know as you know, criminologists have told us, criminologists like Rob have told us that law only functions functions as an effective general deterrent if it is consistently implemented and where those who ought to be subject to the law enjoy neither legal immunities nor the immunities that flow from power. So then the question is, will the International Criminal Court do that? Looking at the record of the International Criminal Court, its failure in, it pub in prosecuting even the most well-established crimes like, um, like genocide. So we might, question the prospects of criminalization affecting this type of general deterrence. Now, even more worrying for me is that by criminalizing only acts that are unlawful or wanton, that's the definition that's been suggested, this provides a permissive space for precisely those acts 
that constitute the greatest part of ecocide, legalised extraction, legalised deforestation, legalised mass pollution, toxification of rivers and oceans and so on. These are not exceptional acts. These are not wanton acts. These are business as usual in this country, as we've seen by the government's position at COP26. So the second way that criminalization works, which we mentioned very briefly, is what we call the expressive or the performative function of law. So law expresses a normative commitment and thereby works by establishing certain forms of behavior as belong, beyond the pale, right? We don't accept this sort of thing now. Think about something like rape in marriage, right? That rape in marriage laws are not necessarily there to prosecute rape in marriage, but to establish a particular set of normative um, commitments that we hold as foundational for the way that we behave in this society. Not completely effective, of course. Um, so linking that back to Rob's comments and my earlier comments, what we need to change is the norms around who is killable and who is murderable um, and the culpability um, for causing that type of mass killing. But if criminal sanctions against ecocide are able to work along this expressive dimension, we want them to express the right norm, right? We want them to express a fully ecocentric norm, not an anthropocentric norm. So in this case, a weak law, one that sanctions a utilitarian calculus, and this is where I have a slight disagreement with, with Gwyn, where the wrongness of a mass killing of nature is assessed through a utilitarian calculus that compares it to the economic benefits to human, humans, this expresses precisely the problematic relationship between humans and the, the more than humans that we're out to condemn. So a way forward, in my view, um, you know, now this definition is circulating globally. It has a lot of global impetus behind us. So it may not be worth or it may not be wise to put our efforts towards criticising it. It's very unlikely that it's going to get the backing of the state parties to the ICC in any case. Um, so, you know, my view on the way forward is that we need to campaign on that multi-dimensional front that Rob was alluding to in the court of public opinion, in science, in criminology, in law, in political science, in civil society and so on, so that we have a strong definition of ecocide, one that unashamedly embraces a view of nature as having absolute intrinsic non-instrumental value. And at the same time, if we're going to be pushing for domestic laws, these same principles that I talked about of whether law is actually going to be an effective general deterrent and whether it's going to provide an expressivist function around this normative change. I think those are the principles that we need to be thinking about both at the domestic, both at the international and at the, and at the domestic level. So I'll pass over to Tiny. Danny. All right. Um, well, thank you, Danny. And thank you very much, Michelle, for this really welcome invitation. It's a great group to be a part of and in dialogue with, and we really value it. Um, so I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Ngunnawal people of the Canberra region, and I pay respect to, to their elders past and present. Um, what I'll do briefly is to touch on a couple of our concerns about the, the draft article and the definition that has been forwarded by the Stop Ecoside campaign and their independent legal panel. Um, but I want to quickly move on to the bigger picture of what they actually do really well and get right and look and argue for the principle that would underpin what, what it get, gets right and why it could be of value in thinking about codifying ecocide at the domestic level. So if we recall the draft definition, um, it defined ecocide as unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge, and this is the bit that I'm interested in, that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Now, 
we know that the independent panel had said, look, we think those thresholds, severe and either widespread or long-term damage, may taken alone be overly inclusive. Um, therefore, we're going to require a second threshold that the proof is that the acts are unlawful and wanted. Now, Danny and I have written a piece in the conversation, which puts out puts down many of our concerns about this. That can also be accessed uh, in the blog on the Planet Politics Institute website as well, uh, if people are interested. Um, and I'd note that both in the paper we drafted that we're working on at the moment um, and in an article by Liana Minkova in the Journal of Genocide Studies, all of us are arguing that really that second threshold of, of lawful and wanton should be removed from the definition and that it would actually improve it and make it more ecologically stringent. Um, and our concern there was that really, you know, I'll concede to Gwyn and to um, Jojo Meta, who commented on a conversation piece that they really want this to be interpreted in a, an environmentally integral kind of way, an ecocentric way. Um, but our concern is that the way everything is drafted, that you just get a few bad legal interpretations by, by judges and you have a bad precedent and therefore the entire kind of ecological intent of the law could be undermined. And we had broader concerns that the way the draft looked, it could undermine more ecologically rigorous understandings of sustainable development and weaken the ecocentric um, biospheric norms that are in the Biodiversity Convention, um, which I think are gradually being strengthened um, with each new 10-year plan and so on. Um, but the concern is that uh, if this comes into the ICC statute in the current form, it would be viewed as a higher standard than what's in, say, the Biodiversity Convention. But let, let me focus on what, what is really good about the definition and how we can work with it. So our argument in our paper, and I think what is happening in this part of the definition, is that we should view ecocide um, against a standard we call ecological stringency. And that com would combine a scientific assessment of ecosystem integrity and change with an overriding ethical commitment to ecosystem flourishing. So that is, there would be fidelity to what is actually occurring in ecosystems, how they're linked, interlinked with each other and the atmosphere and flows of water and movements of animals, um, an appreciation of the value of the myriad lives that coexist within them and a fundamental commitment to their integrity, survival and flourishing. So what's going to be happening there is that there's an interplay between ecological science and ecological ethics. And I think Rob's point about needing courts and judges who, what was the term, um, are ecologically savvy, I think this is what we're trying to get at here. So when you look at the definition, you can see that the core elements of the crime rest on establishing what you could call ecological facts. So to be se severe, there must be very serious adverse changes, disruption or harm to any element of the environment. And the environment is defined as the earth, its biosphere, cryosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere and atmosphere and, out and outer space. Um, so this is moving well beyond the Stockholm Declaration's view of a human environment. This is the biosphere and the Earth system as we understand it. And then that would include grave impacts on human life, on natural, cultural, economic resources, bringing in a kind of weak anthropocentrism that we think is entirely appropriate and valuable. Then to be widespread, it has to extend 
beyond a limited geographical area across state boundaries or be suffered by an entire ecosystem or species or a large number of human beings. Again, you can see scientific work in a sense, giving us trust, trustable judgments. And then finally, to be long-term, it would have to be irreversible or which cannot be redressed through natural recovery within a reasonable period of time. Um, and again, I think science helps us think through what that is. Um, so we have ecological stringency provided by a definition that is ecological reference points and can be objectively verified through scientific understanding of ecosystem complexity, relationality, scale and change. Um, and that should be the core criteria in thinking about ecocide and other interests need to be supplemental and never per permitted to override them. So let me just finish with a comment um, about this morning's news that came on the ABC about the investigation into Vic Forest's illegal logging in the Thompson water catchment of the Victorian highlands. And what that really was honing in on was the fact that this was unlawful because logging is prevented in areas designated as, as having a human interest, that is on steep slopes in water catchments for the Melbourne area. So the violation there was a technical one. It was unrelated to the intrinsic value of the forest. And I think that's a, a really problematic function of our environmental legal architecture in this country. And a crime of ecocide would challenge it. It would challenge that kind of paradigm that divides up living and connected ecosystems according to competing ontologies. One would treasure the biodiversity and the entanglement of beings and matter, and the other would face that, that entirely and see them as merely resources. You know, the material components of a, a product and profit chain um, that's just laying in wait for us. In an article, Blue Screen Biosphere, I call this a zombie biome, a life that was simultaneously alive or dead, live and dead, and alive only for the purposes of becoming food or utile matter or profit in a ledger and torn from its rich purposes and connections. I think the crime of ecocide enables us to think about those connections in a much more productive way. Thank you. Sorry, I'm used to people saying I'm wrapping up now. You just stopped, so that's great. Thank you, Anthony, Tony. Um, look, I, my, my mind is, is buzzing with all of these different ideas. So what we might do now is I've grouped some of the questions and comments together and I might take facilitators' reins and try to group some of these together and get all of you um, to comment or respond as you wish or what's appropriate. So there's a few more questions coming in now too, which I'll gather in a moment. But perhaps just to recap, um, a couple of key points, particularly for anyone in the audience who's new to what's been going on with the ecocide definition. So to recap, earlier this year, um, under the uh, hard work of folks connected to the Stock Ecocide International movement globally, um, a group of lawyers worked hard to develop what they call sort of a model definition uh, for ecocide. So please know that that definition, I've put the link in the comments, is not implemented anywhere. It's not a law yet. Um, all of the hard work that people like Polly Higgins and others have been doing has not yet translated into any form of international law recognising that ecocide is a crime. However, the definition caused a lot of um, excitement and controversy because a lot of folks were saying this is the definition that everyone should now use um, to promote the development of laws preventing ecocide. And as our wonderful um, speakers and commentators have pointed out, um, there are aspects of that definition that many people are not entirely happy with, and I won't recap them. Um, everyone's spoken to them, and we can share more info with you about that if you're interested. Um, Gwyn has had the hard task of taking the existing definition and exploring what that might look like in Australian law. And no one's, um, uh, the issue of how ecocide law might be put together in its first instance in Australia 
exactly as Rob said, will be uh, an extreme act of political bravery by anyone in any state or territory jurisdiction to do that. Um, but in reality, the way it could be done is exactly as Gwen, Gwen has outlined, um, creating these new provisions and new bits and pieces that get stuck into, um, just to be very blunt here without any legalese, squished into the existing criminal laws in different uh, states and territories around Australia. So that's that point. The issue of the definition I think we'll come back to because we've got a couple of a bigger picture questions that we might raise first. So the use or otherwise, the support or otherwise for that current international definition is actually a very interesting issue that we'll come back to. One of the questions that popped up early on, and I think uh, perhaps Rob and I particularly might speak to this, um, one person asked, so what was the process in New Zealand getting the Whanganui River um, its own legal entity? And then somebody asked, asked about if the natural world is to be made a citizen, um, would, wouldn't this grant the same right as a human being? And Costa Rica has already moved to do this. So I might start with a quick distinction between ecocide law and rights of nature, but I'd really love Rob and anyone else to, to, to join me. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, and this is why I use that sort of daggy umbrella picture, just to remind you that a whole bunch of different kinds of laws have emerged, particularly in the 21st century, inside um, written modern style legal systems. The way to think about, if you're not a lawyer, the simplest way to think about rights of nature versus ecocide is ecocide fits into criminal law, um, which Gwyn spoke to beautifully about criminal law is set up in a domestic jurisdiction. Um, rights of nature is something different. You could think about it as civil law, but that doesn't always help people who aren't lawyers. Rights of nature is where fundamentally in the legal system, the current Western legal system does not see the living world as alive or having any of, any of its own entity uh, respect for it as a, as a tree or a wombat. It's not. In the, in the English legal system inherited by the Australians, it's fair to say that generally speaking, nature is an object. It's an object that can be chosen to be protected like a national park, or it's an object that we can um, kill en masse and eat or it could be an object like land that we tear down everything on it and do something else with it. So one of the reasons rights of nature has emerged as this really important contentious spearhead concept is that it challenges the very foundations of industrialized societies seeing nature as nothing more than objects, furniture in the background, resources for humans to use. As Sabine says there, so different from the Aboriginal worldview, absolutely. So rights of nature, started to emerge in the early 2000s in the USA at the local level where local communities were saying, we're sick of corporations coming in and trying to take our water or pollute our water. We're going to assert that we, the community have the right to defend nature and we're gonna assert that nature has its own rights. They also asserted that corporations would be stripped of their rights in that place. Technically speaking, they didn't actually have the legal power to do it, but it's created a movement. Then you had Ecuador and a few other places that said, we respect and see the rights of nature to exist, thrive and evolve across an entire jurisdiction. And that means that they try to respect the rights of nature and to rebalance human notions of property. What we then saw in the New Zealand situation was something completely different. So it's not pure rights of nature law slapped across a jurisdiction. It was actually created under negotiations between the Maori people and the government under the treaty, under the Treaty of Waitangi. And there's a long story, but they chose a legal personhood construct, which is actually what corporations have. It's the same rights that legal corporations have. The right to sue and be sued, to own property, et cetera. It's not really expressing itself as a right for nature. It's um, giving person-oriented legal personhood rights to a chunk of nature. Nonetheless, we've seen all these other styles emerge and I won't go any further, but it's really important to me as an Aylorite that folks wherever possible understand that rights of nature is something separate to criminal law. It's trying to assert that these things have rights, either so um, people can go to court and speak with it for it, or that you have other mechanisms to protect nature. Um, so that's why ecocide is different from rights of nature. But if you wanted to develop a really lovely suite or menu of different earth-centered ways of pushing back at Western law, um, something like, rights of nature, but done within the cultural context of place is important and ecocide and many other things could be done. So that's a very long answer, isn't it? But Rob, did you want to add anything to that? 
Um, just to say that ecocide doesn't require one to have an ecocentric worldview. Um, ecocide is about protecting the environment, but it could be protecting the environment for human purposes. And indeed, a lot of the um, European manual on, on human rights, for example, and environmental rights is, is precisely about a human centered notion of the environment. Um, yeah, there's nothing intrinsic to ecocide uh, about the rights of nature. Uh, on the other hand, the rights of nature is not necessarily only and solely uh, about the intrinsic value of nature, because the Ecuador Constitution also talks about the instrumental use of nature. Um, and so, and this is could take us into a very long discussion. We don't want let's, to get let's into not that. go there. <laughs> there. There is a there is if we as humans live in nature, then we must also instrumentally use nature. Uh, whilst still being able to value the intrinsic value of nature itself. Uh, and that's, anyway, I'll, I'll, and, and, I'll and people like that an assertion yeah. and comment rather than, than a question. But I think yeah. that it is important to make that distinction between um, ecocide and rights of nature. And also bear in mind that concepts like ecological sustainability or, or sustainable development likewise have both an anthropocentric interpretation and an ecocentric interpretation. So whilst we talk about the precautionary principle and intergenerational equity and so on, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's an ecocentric concept of, of, of nature. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, there's so much to unpack in this and perhaps just give a plug. Uh, this year, Ayla has been hosting webinars on rights of nature and discussing the relationship of ecocide and rights of nature. Next year, we'll have a whole nother series of webinars on different issues. So do stay in touch with us if you're interested in learning more. Um, got a couple of questions. I, I've jumped to, uh, Linda has asked a question, which I think is really important. Um, she's got, how do all of these ideas translate into action? How could the courts be changed to consider ecocide? Or are law students given any training in this area so they can gain traction? Um, I might open that up for everyone. I can certainly say as the person who introduced the first Earth Jurisprudence course into a university, um, very few students are taught about ecocide or rights of nature in their degrees. And if they are, it's touched on as one guest speaker. Often it's me. Um, we need to get these concepts out there exactly as you've suggested, Linda, how do they get traction? But what do other folks think? Um, Danny, yeah, and Tony, please. Tony? Just quickly, um, I mean, one thing that the definition does in a very interesting way is improve on the way in which um, these kind of tests are already in the international law of armed conflict. Um, so when I was telling my own students at the Defence Force Academy about this stuff, they knew about that body of law and that, that was a bridge for them. It made sense in that sense. Um, I think it would be relatively simple to, to bring a crime of ecocide at the state level, but it does challenge the way we think about development approvals. And, and there's a much greater level of stringency around what level of ecosystem change or destruction you can produce in building a road or housing development or anything else. Um, so that's the shift that needs to happen. But you can, you can, in a sense, combine the ecocentric and the weekly anthropocentric view and that if you appreciate that protecting ecosystems protects ecosystem services that human, humans derive from ecosystems and the enjoyment and the, all the other value, you can value both. Um, it's about not, it's about getting away from the zero sum game where one interest must always sacrifice another. And we often I, see this, yeah, I was gonna say, oh, yes, Gwyn, but we, we often see this in the right to the environment, a human right to a healthy environment and nature's rights and people are always putting them against each other, but they're all connected. Sorry, yeah. Gwyn. Can, can I, I just, um, just a reflection. Um, in 1997, uh, I was um, a legal officer for um, at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. 
and there was the chief prosecutor, um, a, a lady by the name of Louise Arbour. She was smaller than me in high heels, but very revered by the by all of the the other lawyers in the tribunal. And she came out of her room one day and she said, "I've got the law." I've got the indictments, where are the defendants? And she actually, there's a, they did a kind of a Hollywood movie about her uh, where she donned on the flak jacket, went to Bosnia and got the indictments and got them across the border. Um, and so so my, my suggestion would to, to you would be, don't underestimate the power of, of um, law reform. Once you have the law, um, then the values, everything else um, changes as, as a result of that. And the other, other um, sort of caveat I would put on, on that is don't um, try to water down ecocide because its success will be in um, the choosing of the particular things that you prosecute. It has to be worst cases. When you're talking about ecocide, ecocide is the severe destruction of the environment. Genocide is the targeting of a whole group of, of people. Omnicide is the destruction of everything, do you know? So the threshold itself must be, um, must be very high. Do you know? So they're, they're the two things. I, I think um, once you have the law, um, the rest, uh, may, maybe that's me as a lawyer talking and myself and, and Rob um, um, do do a lot of, to, of teaching to, uh, to our students of, of Ecoside. Um, so we're trying, we're getting the message through to this next generation. So it will come, um, they will grow up with it being um, less of a, um, more of a natural um, flow on of, of things, I think. But thanks, Queen. Yeah, no, thank you. And Danny, did you want to comment on that? Yes, please. You're on mute. Yeah. Very quickly. Uh, just very quickly. I mean, I think what what Gwyn is raising is the relationship between social change and legal change. I mean, I take a different view. I think that the law is very conservative and the, the law lags behind social change. Um, so I would be saying, you know, absolutely let the lawyers uh, and the criminologists be working on law reform, but this has to be a massive social movement. Um, and that is something that everyone can be involved in. Everyone could be having conversations about ecocide around their dinner tables, at their workplaces, um, whether, you know, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a health worker, this is about altering the moral landscape such that beings other than humans come to be seen as murderable as opposed to killing as a matter of routine. Very, very quickly, I just wanted to say something on this question of intrinsic value versus instrumental value. Um, and this goes back to your opening remarks, Michelle. The problem with both framings is both framings assume that individuals exist as, as the ultimate separate bits of being. So something either has value in itself or it has value in so far it's used by someone else. Once we have an entangled ontology, once we understand that we're in a web where we all gain life from our relationships with each other, then neither of those framings on its own really makes sense. The political value of talking about intrinsic value is that against a background of instrumentalization where other beings are cast as nothing but resource for human use, intrinsic value puts, puts, a, puts a stake in the ground to cut that debate. But then the next move in a kind of dialectic is to move beyond either of those poles. Mm, thank you. Important points. And for those who might have trouble with what does instrumental versus intrinsic mean, it means that intrinsic means that the living world just has its own goodness and wonderfulness um, and a right to exist without any reference to human beings. Instrumental is when humans argue that the living world should exist because it's very beneficial to us. Um, and someone like me says, it's kind of actually all of the above, you idiots. Um, the living world is amazing and we are part of it. We are just nature. But yeah, as Danny said, sometimes I find personally the audience is the, is the key to the conversation. If I'm with a group of people who get this concept or that concept, we build on it. If they are literally sitting there with their arms crossed, what about the economy? 
then intrinsic versus instrumental doesn't mean anything. You've actually got to talk them into a new place of, of developing. Hey, we've got a really good question here. I'd love to throw that to you. Can I just Robert, get back yeah, to that question one. of law reform just for a second? Sure. I actually do believe that law reform is, is really important um, as part of a, a, a suite of political interventions. Uh, all the climate litigation occurring worldwide is tremendously powerful, uh, especially given that a large part of it's driven by young people, uh, high school kids and university students. Um, and it's tremendously powerful. And, and when courts actually make certain judgments, uh, they can really upset the apple cart and really kick things down, uh, really. And that's a dinner table conversation there. So I, I think that we shouldn't view any of these things as either or or better than others. I think they're, it's multi-pronged uh, and we do need the multi-pronged approach because basically uh, we have to use any tool that we can because time's running out. Uh, there's an urgency as well. So that an ecocide at least talks to the urgency and to the, the seriousness of the harm. And I think that's why at a rhetorical level, political rhetorical level, it's particularly important. Couldn't agree more. I often talk about the Michelle Maloney splatter approach to social change, which is try everything, see what sticks and different people are gonna get traction on something else. Um, and also just um, in terms of social change, the idea of getting these ideas out there, which someone made a comment, is very important because someone else could pick up with it and run with it in a way no one, none of us have ever imagined and actually have success. So the more we raise these discussions um, and the issues and the possibilities, um, even if we develop a model law of what an ecocide law could look like and it doesn't get traction, the next generation or the, the, the next person who's working on it could get something really terrific. So, hey, um, it's got of linking from what Rob just said. There's a really important question here. Um, how does Australia's climate change inaction fit um, into the whole perspective of ecocide? Perhaps you might start with Gwyn, because I know you've done the Monsanto International uh, Tribunal and such, but theoretically, would Australia's inaction on climate change, if there was an international law on climate change uh, that we actually subscribe to, um, what do you think? Feel free to say pass if it's too much to think about in one minute or less. You're on mute, Gwyn. Yes. I. Um... At, at this stage, a criminal code would be looking at, at prosecuting individuals um, rather than whole governments. Um, and uh, but but certainly, uh, let's say uh, the carb what we call the carbon majors um, or those uh, corporations that um, are uh, um, you know a major emit um, emitters of carbon certainly fall within the, um, the, the, the current definition of, of um, uh, ecocide. So um, I'm not sure, I'd sort of, the, for me, the jury's out as to whether you'd get whole governments prosecuted at a, at a national level. I, don't, I, I think that one's a little bit um, uh, more difficult, but uh, yeah. But certainly um, individuals, uh, that idea of, of um, corporate criminal responsibility um, and individual criminal responsibility, definitely. Mm. It can also be constructed in other ways. So for example, um, a criminal offense is an act or omission. So the failure to act can be criminalized as well as a particular action. And, it, and certainly the existing mechanisms mean that it's, it's difficult to, to criminalize the failure to act under existing ecocide provisions and so on. On the other hand, the Urgenda case in the Netherlands was precisely a civil suit against the government uh, by an activist environment group, Urgenda, uh, saying that you haven't lived up to what you said you were gonna do as part of the climate change targets. Uh, and they won. And they, they not only won in the original court, but they won several times on appeal. So I think that uh, going to the question, the heart of the question is if, if governments aren't acting, what can we do? And, and I think there is some precedent uh, in different shapes and forms that, that we can use the law in to some respect as well. Mm. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions that are sort of interconnected around, um, I think it really comes to the current 
proposed definition by the International Working Group around this wanton um, and lawful or unlawful issue, um, someone says, it looks like there could be an unfortunate loophole that would make logging and mining as exclusions. Um, I wonder how we could not do that. I know it's a bit of a technical issue, but um, Gwyn, Rob, do you have any thoughts on if we were to proceed, let, let's imagine, and we've got to imagine um, an ecocide law in Australia, how could we connect it to large scale land clearing that is unnecessary if we change our economic paradigm? I think in, in the, the model law, um, it's got those that uh, dual um, threshold. Uh, so logging in Australia is currently legal. Um, so you'd go then go to the, the question of wanton, um, which would import that proportionality test uh, where the courts would need to consider um, not only whether the, the harm caused was uh, with this particular logging example, whether the harm was severe, long-lasting, um, uh, widespread, uh, but then it would need to look to, to um, the, uh, the excessiveness of the harm as well. Um, uh, and, and that would not only relate to um, uh, the... Uh, you know, uh, how, how you actually uh, understand that criminal behaviour, but also how you might um, sentence it as well in terms of uh, the, the degree of recklessness, um, the, uh, the degree to which the actions uh, or, it, or uh, emissions of, of the particular logging uh, company was excessive. Um, so it's... Uh, uh, it would really so, depend on the, the definitions chosen and the language used. And, 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 and the particular um, example, yeah. As I say, the success of, of um, ecocide prosecutions is really going to be um, making sure that you really select out the worst e examples. Um, uh, and remembering it's not a sort of panacea for, for all sorts of environmental harm. This is worst case, you know. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, so I've got, oh yeah, yes, Tony, please. Um, I mean, when you talk about logging and in Australia, the, the real controversy issues around old growth forest or land clearing on private agricultural land. And, you know, I, I'm yet to be convinced that that second threshold and the definition of, you know, in economic or social benefit does it does us any good to my mind the way that the thresholds and the core of the definition are, just, are defined are perfect they have the right threshold it's high but it's not impossible because one thing i really want to point out is that when people have talked about the definitions in the international law of armed conflict they've they've stated that the thresholds are so high that they can't be prosecuted and you can't even pick up major environmental war crimes with them. So the panel did a good job in defining those core elements. Um, that's what we really should be promoting. Oh, thanks so much. Yes, Danny. I just wanted to make a comment on proportionality. Uh, the issue is not just proportionality, but the value of the different actors who are affected. And if we look at animal welfare law, we have a, just a glaring example that when the economic interests of human beings are at stake compared to the life interests of other beings, it's still legal in this country to keep pigs in, um, in cages where they can barely move for them to have their children until they're killed. It's still legal to keep animals, to keep hens in batteries where they can't move and their legs disintegrate because the value of those lives is so radically diminished compared to the economic value. So when we're talking about proportionality, we also have to think about what are, the, what are the prior assumptions that we have about the values of the lives of the different players who are involved? No, such rich conversations. And I'm sorry, everyone, we're actually out of time. So 
What I'd like to do first is thank all of our speakers. Um, and if folks know how to press the magic button to show a clapping hand, or you want to do a daggy air clap, or oh, God forbid you do that. I think that just looks like someone's house is on fire. Um, but I really want to thank our speakers. It's been a really brilliant conversation and I'm looking forward to many more to come. Um, I think we all appreciate how urgent our problems are, how slow the law can be, but how important it is to set up examples of a different way of being. Um, so a huge thanks to everyone for all your intellectual energy, your commitment and passion. Um, and I just want to give a quick plug to a small but important thing that Ayla has been working on, turning the whole system upside down where we don't rely on piecemeal approaches. The Green Prince approach, which um, if you've ever heard of me talking about it, please look it up, greenprince.org.au. We're building a, quite an amazing collection and um, network and movement of people saying, we can look at the earth centered worldview and change our economic system so we all thrive, take away the binary, take away the either or, there's lots of other ways to live and do and be inspired by indigenous thinking, knowledge, wisdom. Um, and it's certainly, we work on a whole number of fronts, but actually thinking about the system up as a different way, nurturing the place first and fitting ourselves into that place is what we think is the ultimate, the ultimate dream. Um, but on that note, I'm going to stop talking and just say a huge thank you to everyone who's been with us all this time. Um, the recording will be up on the website by next week if you want to watch any of it again. Thank you so much, everyone. And please, speakers, if you'd like to say goodbye. I shall let you speak. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Michelle, for organising. Thanks, Rob, Tony and Gwen. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care out there. <laughs>